Hi, Bob. Hi, guys. All right, Peter, Bob. ask him. Yeah, Bob, you've seen this a million times. Is there not a better way to do it than the way Philadelphia tried to, to guard the Falcons last night on that last drive? Yeah, a lot better way, as it turns out. <laughs> like, why do I feel like I see that so often, though, and you just know people are open, but it's just ridiculous. Yeah, I, I think sometimes teams get into that mentality of we'll exchange yards for time, but there was a lot of time left, like by NFL standards. So I agree. I mean, they were way too soft and way too passive and made it way too easy. And you're right, you like you've got a team that, really wasn't in much of a passing rhythm the whole game. And, boy, you saw all of a sudden you let them get into a rhythm, and they paid the price. Now, Bob, I know that you're at the Jeff facility. You spoke with Robert Sala. What was his overall take on their win against the Titans? Was he obviously happy for the win, but there are some things they still have to clean up. Yeah, I haven't had a chance to talk to him oh. yet. They're actually, they bumped practice back an extra half an hour, so... Um, and I didn't want to keep you guys waiting because I value your time. Professional. So think of this yeah. way. The 20 plus years has given you, Bob. You're like, you know what? I'm not waiting. I'm going to call the K show. I Correct. love it. There's no chance I'm going to keep you guys like, you know, <laughs> half dancing on your, your program is way too important for that. Thank you. Thank you. All right. So what was your yeah. take on Sunday? Um, my, I mean, I didn't hear you guys. I was at a, a seminar all day yesterday. So Those are um, fun. I'm not sure what your guys thoughts was. My, my thought was. Just overall, kind of from 30,000 feet, I have seen that game a hundred times. And the previous 99 times I've seen that game, over like the last, you know, decade plus, the Jets would normally lose that game like 22 to 6. But they've got Aaron Rodgers. And he made five or six plays in that game where afterwards you're sitting on the bus and you're saying, okay, well, you know, they blocked the punt and only got a field goal out of it. And a couple times they punted from deep in their own end and they had some three and outs. And early in the game, they weren't running the ball real well. And, you know, their defense gave up a few drives. And, you know, they could be better. Like, the defense could definitely play better. And their pass rush could be a little better. And, you know, like, if the running game is certainly going to improve. And as the offensive line gels, they're going to get better. And they were kind of mediocre in some areas. And, wow, here we are. Look at that. They won. How about that? I wonder how that happened. <laughs> Wow, they've got a quarterback, yeah. and that quarterback makes those special plays, and they win. And that's just, to me, the difference in this league and what they haven't had. And he made those seven, six or seven throws, those little mind games where, like, even a little dump-off play that he expertly executed to Braylon Allen, where he faked it to Brees Hall, and he got the whole entire defense, their entire – momentum and all their eyes moving in the wrong direction a little screen dump off and Braylon Allen's got a free access to the end zone and you know he's his football computer brain and you know he'll, he'll throw the ball to a guy that's not open and just throw him open and you know he's special and and that special quality about him I think was the difference in the game you mentioned some of the negatives and in, in the pass rush could be better and now you just lost a main pass rusher in, in Johnson so Last week I asked you, did the performance by the defense move the needle on Redick? Does the injury now move the needle at all on the conversation with Son Redick? Well, I mean, I think the conversation has always been going. I, I don't think it, like, changes philosophically, you know, the, you know, like the entire way that you approach the contract with one player that then sets a precedent for how you deal with going forward all of the other guys – that are already on your team and that you also owe contracts to or will, you know, I mean, if all of a sudden you completely do a 180 and give a player everything that he wants because, you know, now you just kind of cave all of those other agents of all of these other young, talented, soon to be paid players will see that. And they're all going to come calling and be like, Hey, what about me? And so, there's a domino effect there. Like, every financial decision you make affects the finances of all of the other guys on your team and what they're going to want. So, you know, I mean, is there a compromise? You'd always hope there's a compromise between agent, player, organization, and whatnot. Um, maybe more of a sense of urgency. But, no, I, I don't see all of a sudden them turning around and signing Hassan Reddick to some four-year, $100 million contract. I, 
you know, because, you know, Tremaine Johnson got hurt. And, and I think Will McDonald having three sacks certainly impacts that decision, at least a little bit. Yeah, I, I essentially agree with you, Bob, and I'm loath to give in to players that are essentially trying to extort you, but... I mean, Joe Douglas not, might not be the guy negotiating the other contracts if the Jets don't get to the playoffs this year. And they've lost a big part of their defense after, you know, Franklin Edwards is gone and uh, Huff is gone, all of that. So, I, I mean, there has to be some bend where there wasn't bend before if this is a win-now team with a 40-year-old quarterback. You have to bend. Yep, and, and there might be also some bend from – a player mm -hmm. who, like, to me, the best comp is Le'Veon Bell. And to me, if I'm advising him, you know, man, like, be careful here. You are risking, A, getting back money you are never going to get back. B, possibly having a contract next year come your way. I mean, you're still under the Jets' control next year. You need to set up this entire season this year. Your contract just rolls to next year. And they still have your control next year. So I'm not totally... It's not like he sits out this year and becomes a free agent next year. B. And C, Le'Veon Bell sat out a season, and we all saw what he was when he came back. He was never the same player again and never got paid again. So I don't know. I, you know, to me, I, there's no guarantee that you're going to sit out a season and just jump back into the NFL and be a 12-13 sack a a year guy again and teams aren't going to pay you 20 25 million dollars a year until they see you do that again so you're still going to have to come back into the league and have a prove it year again uh, so there should be bend on his side too couldn't agree with but you there's more. a win-win there's a win-win for both sides here right like he needs to still come back into the league and still prove that he can do this and go earn it in the walk year. Go be that player. So now next year, you fulfilled your contract. You're now a walk year player. You're that pass rusher. You're a free agent next year. And now, man, you have hit the lottery. Now you are a $25 million player next year. And now you can break the bank because everybody's going to believe it. And, you know, now you fulfilled your contract. Um, and, and then the Jets also get an impact player at a position that they need. Because now you're right, Jermaine Johnson being gone is a killer. And there's a guy who, you know, I have to tell you, my heart breaks for him. It just absolutely, because he, you want to talk about a guy that every single guy on this team, you know, there was a reason the entire team came off the sideline and all put their hands on his shoulder and his helmet and, and saw him off the field um, because he's that kind of kid. Uh, what's the word on Mosley for Thursday? I don't know. I, I mean, truly a 50-50 at this point. I, I mean, I haven't gotten word myself yet. I haven't seen, you know, I know he didn't practice yesterday. I, I don't know what status he is today. They're still on the practice field, so I don't know that they've put out today's um, injury report yet. He was a, a DNP yesterday. Um, probably not surprising with the short week, but they would certainly sit him on day one. Um, if he gets any kind of practice status today, that's probably a very good sign for, you know, a couple of nights from now. Um, but that, that's a good question. I thought Jamie and Sherwood played really well in his absence, so that was promising. Uh, but, you know, you'd like to have him. I mean, certainly in the absence of – and I don't know what DJ Reed's status is for Thursday night as well. So, like, both of those guys, he did practice a little bit yesterday, so that's at least promising. He got limited practice um, as his status, so at least he was on the field. But you, you at least would like those two guys to be back, knowing that you lost Jermaine Johnson. Well, I was going to say too, and with that thinking, Bob, do you have to, do you have to be even more careful, being that you're down such a key part of your defense already, to not try to rush CJ back, given that it's the short week. Do you, do you maybe just consider taking the L and resting him for next week? Oh, and the way that the guys played in his absence, Brandon Eccles having a pick, Jamie and Sherwood playing well. I mean, look. You know, everybody has injuries, right? So, yes, there's no question you are going to, you know, if your depth gets tested, your depth gets tested, and you put guys out there, I mean, there's, you have backups for a reason. You know, you don't put injured players out there in a short week right. uh, in week three. There's, there's no question. So, yes, they will want those guys to be as healthy as possible. Um, you know, this is not week 16, week 17, where it's a win-and-you're-in situation to get to the playoffs. You're right. Do you look at this Patriot game – 
on Thursday a little bit differently than you did maybe two weeks ago because the Patriots won their first game. They lost in overtime to Seattle in the second game. I thought they'd be a pushover every single week, and Bob, it doesn't seem like they're a pushover. I don't think they're a good team, but they're not an easy mark anymore. Yeah, I, I agree 100%. Um, they surprised me at least a little bit. Now, I watched the Bengals game. I didn't see any of the uh, the Seahawks game because – that game was happening uh, simultaneously when, you know, the Jet game was going on and, and then traveling. So um, I'll have to go back and watch some of that game. But I did watch the Bengals game because um, the Jets being a Monday night game. And the Bengals, you know, turned the ball over in a couple of absolutely brutal spots in that game. And it was kind of a classical, the Patriots not playing terribly well, but just playing completely mistake-free and allowing the other team to kind of self-destruct and waiting for the mistakes to happen and winning the game because the other team just self-destructed, fumbling a ball at the goal line in the end zone and and so forth. So, um, yeah, I mean, you know, the, the culture is still there, right? Like, Gerard Mayo came from the Bill Belichick culture. It's that tree. It's still, like, we're not committing penalties. We're not making dumb turnovers. Jacoby Brissett's a, you know, a well-traveled but veteran backup quarterback. They, they, they're not going to have the rookie quarterback out there that's going to panic at the five-yard line and throw the ball backwards, right? Like, that's that's not what he's probably going to do on Thursday night. He probably won't give them a gift like that. So, um, yeah, and it's still, you know, it's still that helmet. It's still that uniform. It's still that kind of winning legacy. So they're not the most talented team in the world. But would I be stunned if this is a game in the fourth quarter that's, you know, four points, seven points, with some tension involved? No, I mean, I wouldn't be stunned. I know it's only a couple of weeks, Bob, but I can't remember this team having a pair of running backs like this. Well, I, I remember talking to, to Robert Sala before the season, you know, back like kind of like late spring, early summer. And this was just even coming out of OTAs. Like this wasn't even a training camp yet. And he said this is the best running back room he'd ever been a part of or had ever seen with the two kids they've drafted to go along obviously with Brees Hall because we can see what Brees Hall is right like he's a matchup nightmare I, I thought one of the best sound bites from the game was Aaron Rodgers talking about how the go route to Brees Hall came right you know Aaron multiple times a little kind of late getting out of the huddle or guys a little late getting into the huddle um Alan Lazard was one running late onto the field and they had to burn a timeout because all almost a delay a game and one of those happened and all of a sudden now they're at the other end of the field and while they had one of those timeouts, Brees Hall comes over to him and says, if they walk up a linebacker on me, throw me a go ball. And Aaron goes, all right. And and that was it. Like, that that's how that play happened. And all of a sudden, it's a touchdown. And now you've got Braylon Allen, yes, who, like, he looks like that out of pads. Like, if anybody's ever seen him just in, you know, OTAs, like in shorts, he's just one of those guys that's like, he looks like he's wearing football pads when he's not wearing football pads. Um, Isaiah Davis, really impressive in the preseason. Last year, kind of the star of the preseason was Izzy Abanaconda, and he can't even get active because the other three guys are all ahead of him. So, yeah, their, their running back room is young and deep.